Thanks, Andy. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, do you know what? It's so amazing as well to, to be in a church in Wales. As you, are we in Wales? Yes. We are in Wales. That's what I thought. I just wondered why there was no cheer after I said that. That was all. If I spend much longer listening to Gwydion, though, my dodgy Barry accents are going to come out, I think. So I'll end up halfway through the sermon, I'll end up sounding like Ness from Gavin and Stacey. So apologies for that. But uh, it is good to be back in Wales. Um, since I was here last, quite a lot has happened. Um, I, I've left at the church in Barry where I came to faith and where I was an apprentice pastor and assistant pastor and then started a pastorate in, in Wellington Chapel in Hereford. And uh, it's interesting what Gideon was saying this morning about the Bible. We have a reputation in Hereford for being the church that's always going on about Jesus and takes the Bible a bit seriously, which I take as a massive compliment. Um, but this is what you like here, isn't it? You love Jesus, always going about Jesus, always going about the Bible, and you take it seriously. This is how you live your life. That's how it should be. And um, thank you also for today for a bit of a rest for me. I'm preaching on, on judges in the morning at Wellington and revelation in the evening, so a lot of idolatry, a lot of <laughs> correction. Um, and really, we're just going to zoom in on one verse this morning, 2 Peter 3.18, and this is our text for the year uh, at Wellington Chapel. So I, I hope and pray that whenever you, you think about this verse, that it will prompt you to pray for us, because we, we need your prayers. I'm just going to read verse 18 again. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Our oh, Father, please help me to get out the way so that nobody hears just my voice this morning. If people just hear from me, then they're not going to be helped from heaven. They're not going to change. They're not going to be more like Jesus. So, Lord, I pray that you would speak by your Spirit. And I pray this for your glory's sake. Amen. So this is the, the closing chapter uh, in, in 2 Peter, but it's also the closing chapter of Peter's life. So his life is coming to an end. He's about to be killed, martyred, crucified. And church history tells us that he, he asked the people, look, I don't deserve to die in the same way as my Savior Jesus. So if you're going to crucify me, please can you do it upside down? He's about to die. And he's been talking about the return of Jesus, the day of the Lord, the Bible calls that quite a lot. When all sin is removed, as we've already heard this morning, a place of no pain, no suffering, an incredible time. And Jesus is going to return and he's going to put all the wrong right. And Peter's saying, if you're a Christian, obviously you're looking forward to that day. Obviously. It's going to be an incredible day. The greatest day ever. But are you ready? What are you doing now to prepare yourself for that day? Because all the world, the people who don't believe the Bible, the people who don't trust in Jesus, they're the ones that are on your case all the time. They're the scoffers who are saying, where is he then? Keep going on about this Jesus. He keeps saying he's going to come back and put everything right. Where is he? It's been a while, haven't it? Is he coming? Are you sure? And we need to be absolutely sure that he's coming because it could be today he might return before the end of this sermon some of you might be praying that that's the case in a little while but it could be though couldn't it it could be today and so peter's saying to us the holy spirit is saying to us through peter i should say be ready for that day surely you want to be spotless blameless and at peace with him Verse 1, he says, you want to have wholesome thinking. So as Christians, it's not just about what we do. It's not just about what we say, but it's also about what we think. And we're in control of that. So that's often our mind and our thinking is the filter between what's in our heart, which we can't trust. It's just it's wicked. Some of the feelings and, and things that spring up out of our heart, woof. But it's in our mind where we can start to take control. And we need to be transformed in our thinking. What do you spend most time thinking about? Because that will give you a good clue as to any idols you're struggling with. It'll give you a good clue on, into how 
much in love with Jesus you are, what do you think about? In verse 16, it, Peter says, look, I know some of this is hard to understand. Some of the Bible's hard. Some of Paul's writings are difficult to understand. Even as pastors, we don't read it and go, oh yeah, obviously. Every single chapter, every single verse, we have to wrestle with it, we have to work hard, we have to pray. It's quite hard, and especially because there's a lot of people out there who want to distort what the Bible says. They want to twist it to benefit themselves, usually, to get a following. They want you to follow them, not follow Jesus. So he says in verse 17, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. You need to discern what you hear. You need to weigh up what you hear now against what the Bible says. And does that match up? If not, ignore it. Ignore it. And then verse 18, the verse we're going to focus on, three very simple things. Grow in grace, grow in knowledge, glorify Jesus. I'm just going to break it down. Three very, very simple points. So firstly, growing in grace. Actually, I'll start with a question. Do you want to increase your faith this year? By the end of this year, do you want to look more like Jesus? Or are you at that point where you're like, do you know what? I'm, I'm all right where I'm at. I'm doing okay. I'm fine. Maybe you even think like some of the Corinthians, I've, I'm there. I've kind of, I've reached the peak. Or are you desperate to change and grow? Are you longing to be more like him every single day? Because my prayer for Kaiwent for this church specifically, is that this place becomes, maybe it is already, I'm sure it is already, a spiritual grow bag. Many of you have grown physically a lot since I've been here last. But spiritually, that's the key thing, isn't it? Are we growing spiritually? Are we taking hold of what God has for us? Chapter 1, verse 2 tells us that grace can be multiplied. Verse 3 tells us that grace is all we need. Now, if you read different uh, theological books or any, even some basic Christian books, they'll say, well, grace is the unmerited favor of God. So that's more of a technical explanation of grace. If we're going to really simplify it and break it down, grace is help from heaven that you don't deserve. Heavenly help poured out on earth that you can receive to grow and change and be more like Jesus. You don't deserve it, but it's God's given help. And you just receive it. You don't have to repay him for it, but you do have to receive it. That's why the Bible tells us we should be like children. Not childish, but childlike. Always like that with God. Help me, help me, help me, have mercy on me, please help me. Not, oh, well, I'm, I'm actually, I'm okay in this part of my life. Because maybe you, you have that struggle. I know I do. Where I'm like, well, I'm okay at doing that stuff here on earth. So I, I don't really pray so much about that stuff because I'm all right at it. But that stuff, I'm terrible I pray a lot about that. Or maybe you're the kind of person that prays just about the big things. You're good at your job, you're, you're a decent parent or grandparent or uncle or auntie. So you think, well, I'm all right there. I'll just pray if someone gets sick because I'm no doctor, I'm no physician, I can't heal people like Jesus. So I'll just pray for the big stuff. One of Spurgeon's favorite hymns says, Grace, tis a charming sound, harmonious to the ear. Heaven with the echo shall resound and all the earth shall hear, saved by grace alone. This is all my plea. Jesus died for sinful man and Jesus died for me. For 250 years, Christians have been singing that John Newton song. What is it? Amazing grace. And it is amazing. It's absolutely amazing. And, and you may be here this morning, maybe you're not even a Christian, and, and maybe you, like me, 11 years ago, I struggled to accept that God would love me. And then when I, I come to the realization, actually, there is a God, and, but why would he love me? 
I don't deserve his love. And I started to think all these thoughts, like maybe if I, if I do some good things, that can impress God, and then maybe you will love me more. Or you'll start to love me, perhaps. But if you're a Christian, if you're a child of God, you can't be loved any more than you're already loved. He was loving you before he even created the universe. And his love is so vast, we can't measure it. And you don't deserve it, you're absolutely right. But if he loves you, he loves you. Maybe you're at the opposite end of the spectrum. Maybe your sin is pestering you so much and you just can't, you can't get beyond it. And what you need to be reminded of is where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. You can't out-sin God's grace. I don't know what you've done in your life. It doesn't matter in many ways because however big it is in your mind, Jesus, the grace in Jesus is more. There's enough in Jesus to cover over your sin. And you might have particular things that you're thinking about. Even right now, you're thinking, yeah, but you don't know about that. I don't. But Jesus does. Because Gwydion's already told us that Jesus knows all things. Everything. He's all-knowing. So he knows that thing. And he still says, my grace is enough. It's enough for you. And it's God's grace that, that makes the gospel truly glorious and, and mind-blowing and overwhelming at times, but how do we grow in it? How can you grow in grace? Well, I think the first thing that we have to get our heads around is we have to stop thinking, well, I'm good at this, but I'll, I'll call on God if, if I need help in this area of my life where I'm not so good. Jesus doesn't talk like that. He doesn't say to his followers, okay, if the big stuff, just give me a shout and I'll help you out. The rest of the stuff you can get by all right. Well, you're quite good at that, that's okay. Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. Nothing at all. Absolutely nothing. That's why the Apostle Paul says we need to be praying always, all the time we need to be praying because we need help all the time need to be like this all the time. I need help from heaven in every second of every day, in every moment, in every situation. I need help. And God is so willing to give that help, but are we as willing to receive it? Or do we turn our back on him? Because repentance is turning away from self and the world and sin and turning to God. So what are we doing when we're turning our back on God? We're saying, I can manage fine on my own, thanks. I don't need your help. And he's there waiting, willing to pour out. Listen to, to Jesus in John 17. He prays to the Father about us, about Christians, and he says, I have given them the glory that you gave to me. Jesus has received from the Father, and he says, I want to give that to them. I'm giving that to them. They don't deserve it, but I want to pour it out on them. John 20, at the resurrection, Jesus appeared to Mary, and he said this, Go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Jesus shares all that he has with his followers. The only perfect family that we read about in the Bible is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Every other family that God works with is a broken, dysfunctional family in some way. So Jesus is part of the only perfect family, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and he says, I want to share that with my followers, with Christians. He shares his father with us. He shares that perfect relationship, that perfect unity. And then we can receive his grace and we can grow in holiness. I don't know if you're the, the kind of Christian that reads the Bible or hears it being read and, and you 
You hear that word holiness and it freaks you out a little bit. You kind of shiver. It's like, oh no. He said the H word. Holiness. Panic. Well, thankfully, in this chapter, it also reminds us twice that God is patient. Verse 9 and verse 15. Let's just read those verses again just to to be sure in our mind that God is definitely patient with us. He's not expecting us to be exactly like Jesus today. Verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you. And then verse 15, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation. So God is patient, but he is expecting us to grow to be holy. He says, be holy as I am holy. And growing in grace is linked to holiness. Because in and of ourselves, we're not holy, are we? We're the complete opposite of holy. We're sinful. We're corrupt. Even our heart, the center of our being is is desperately wicked. Even after we've come to faith. But Jesus is holy. So if I'm going to be holy, I need to be like Jesus. I need what Jesus has. I need to receive from him. I need his grace. I need to grow in that grace if I'm going to be more holy. You know, I think, well, okay. If this is all coming from heaven, if it's all down to Jesus in heaven, then I can just chill. I can just relax as a Christian and and God will do what God will do with me and I haven't really got to take part in anything. He does it all. He gave me the gift of faith and and he's the one who's going to grow me. I'll just let him do it. Well, yes and no. You you can rest in your salvation that Jesus did all the hard work at the cross. He's the one who died for your sin. He's the one who, who defeated death and Satan and sin itself and rose on the third day in victory. He did that. You did nothing. But you've also got to work out your salvation in fear and trembling. You've also got to do what Peter tells us we've got to do, and that's be diligent. Diligent means to, to work hard. You've got to work hard. We've got to work hard as Christians. We, we take part in this. We don't just sit back and chill and say, well, God will do what God will do. He's got all the power. Heaven's got everything that we need, but we've got to get hold of it. We've got to receive it and and put it into action and change from the inside out. So we can't get any more saved, but you can get more grace. You can grow in the likeness of Jesus. Let's just read that verse again. Verse 14, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Now, for some of you, that might mean that you have to work hard to stop working hard in your own strength. Because you, you are hard working, you are servant hearted, you are willing to do lots of different things in church and at home and, and amongst your neighbors and in the workplace, but you're doing it in your own strength. And, and generally, it'll be like that all the time because you work really hard and then you'll burn out. And then you get despondent and a bit like, Phew. You might not get the the acclaim that you're looking for or the credit or or the the praise and say, oh, I'm not doing that again. I'll do something else. (coughs) But if you're always grasping hold of the grace that God has, if you're always looking heaven-bound for the help and you're not interested in impressing anyone on earth or getting any praise or acknowledgement on earth, well, then you know that God logs everything. He sees everything. So you don't need anyone on earth to see it or log it or thank you. You don't need a thank you. It's nice to have a thank you, isn't it? It's encouraging, it keeps us going, but you don't need it because you know that Jesus sees all things and he logs all things. Ephesians 4 verse 15 says, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. 1 Peter 2 2 says, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. If we don't grow, we just stand still. One Christian writer a long time ago said, if we stand still, we're backsliding. 
We need to be growing. We need to be on the move all the time, traveling down that narrow road. It's a bit like being on a bike. If you're on a bike, as long as you're pedaling, you're right. You're on the move. You're secure. You stop pedaling. That's when you're more likely to fall off. You've got to keep pedaling. We've got to keep going and keep growing. And God has all the help that we need. And you experienced grace for the first time when you came to the cross. But when the Bible speaks about grace, it's not only a past tense thing. So we're not just looking at the cross here. It's a present tense thing. It's a future tense thing. It's a daily thing that we need as Christians to keep growing all the time. It's a bit like... um, my wife, Carla, hates me using football illustrations, but this is the only way I can think of describing it, so apologies for that. But it, I played in midfield sometimes when I played football, and, and one of the things that your coaches just were on to you all the time was being on the half turn. So if you're the defenders, we're, we're scoring that way. My strikers are behind me, so you're the defenders, and we, we want to go that way. But if I'm a midfield player and I just say, right, yes, yes, give me the ball, give me the ball, I don't know where my strikers are. I don't know where the wingers are. I don't know what the defenders are doing. I don't know any of that stuff. But if you've got the ball and I'm looking at my attackers, I'm like, right, the striker's there, the winger's there. That's where I'm going. But the ball's behind me. What good is that? I can't receive the ball from you. So instead, I need to be on the half turn. I need to be looking back at the defenders, but I also need to see where my strikers are. I need to see where I'm going. But I need to see where the ball is too. So I need to receive it on the half turn. It's a bit like that as Christians. We need to look back at the cross all the time. We need to to see where we've come from, where we've been. But we also need to be looking ahead. We need to be looking forward. We need to be on the move, on the half turn. When we take communion, what do we say? What do we think of? Well, we're thinking about the cross. We're thinking about Jesus' body and his blood until he comes. (laughs) So we're looking back, but we're also looking forward as well. And we need grace all the way through. All the way through. C.S. Lewis said this, when I speak of a man growing in grace, I mean simply this, that his sense of sin is becoming deeper, his faith stronger, his hope brighter, his love more extensive, his spiritual mindedness more marked, he feels more of the power of godliness in his own heart. He manifests more of it in his life. He is going on from strength to strength, from faith to faith, and from grace to grace. Let's grow in the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Second point, growing in knowledge. This is the 13th time that the word knowledge or knowing is used in this letter. And it starts back in chapter 1, verse 3. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Do you believe that? Do you actually believe that God has all that you need for you to live a godly life? Or do you think it's impossible? Do you think it's it's found elsewhere other than from God? Because if you do believe that, then your relationship with Jesus will grow. As you grow in grace and you'll, you'll grow deeper in your knowledge of him as well. So back to chapter 1, verse 5, it says, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing... They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's saying, you might know Jesus, you might know a lot of stuff, you might know a lot of Bible, but you're not fruitful. 
So the knowledge that you have is useless. It's completely wasted because it's stuck in your head. And it hasn't filtered into your heart and into your mind to affect your speaking and your doing and your thinking. It's just there. It's just cognitive knowledge. But when the Bible uses the word knowledge, it's a relational word. It's not just a cognitive word. It's not about IQ. The Bible exalts wisdom more than IQ, that's for sure. And wisdom is the application of knowledge. It's putting what we know into action. If it just stays up here, ineffective, unfruitful. Oh, horrible words, aren't they? Do we want that on our tombstone when we die? Born this date, died this date, came to this chapel, ineffective and unfruitful. No family member is going to write that on a tombstone, obviously. But is that what heaven sees? It's not what we want, surely. And this is why grace and knowledge work together side by side. And this is why we, we talk about grace first, and that's why grace is mentioned first in the verse, before knowledge. Because if we just increase and we grow in knowledge without grace, then it's a knowledge that puffs up. And that's the opposite of what we want. We want grace that builds up. And so the more that we know about Jesus through his word, through each other, through prayer, the more it makes us realize we haven't got a clue. Because since I've been to this church, like I've been to Bible college, I've I've preached a lot more sermons and I've read a lot more big Christian books. And do you know what I've come to realize? I know nothing. Next to nothing about Jesus. There's so much more I need to know. There's so much more growth that needs to happen in my life personally. Let alone teaching other people. The more I know, the more I realize I'm lacking. The more I need is grace. So it's not a knowledge that, that makes us arrogant and proud. And if you do meet those Christians, and especially if they refer them to themselves as mature Christians, be careful. Because it might be that they have lots of knowledge, but it's a knowledge that's just puffed them up. And they're lacking in, in grace. The word disciple literally means student, learner. And this is Peter writing as well, a fisherman. If we just assessed his writing style in the original Koine Greek, and we, we put that side by side with someone like the Apostle Paul, we would say, a bit basic, isn't it? Goodness me. The Apostle Paul's like a, a lecturer in a university. Great intellect. Peter's quite basic. You look at his character, his nature, when we read the Gospels, he's always the first one to speak, often without thinking. But he's actually saying what everyone else is thinking, usually. He's not bright, is he? Oh, what an idiot. But he wasn't an idiot. It took him a while, and he made some big mistakes. He even got to the point where he was threatened by a little, a little girl, a little servant girl, and he said about Jesus... I don't know him. I don't know him. But then he repented of that. At a beautiful moment where he realized, before that even happened, Jesus told me that would happen. And, and he said in Luke twenty two thirty one, 31, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. And when you turn back, when you repent, strengthen the brethren. Learn from this. Grow from this. You know your mistake. Your mistake was pride. You think you can do it, and you can't. Because Peter's response in that situation was, I will go to you. I will die for you. Jesus is like, no, you won't. You're going to deny me three times. That's what's going to happen. And Peter got to that point where he did repent, and he realized, I don't need to know everything. I don't need to be a know-it-all, but I need to be close to the one who does know it all need to be close to Jesus. 
I just need to throw myself before him and say, you have everything that I need. I just want to know you. I want that relationship with you. Now, we're all at different stages in, in our Christian faith, in our journey, and it might be you've recently come to faith. Praise God. That's, that's really exciting if that's you. And it might be that at the moment you just need some milk. And that's okay. A little baby, a few rows from the back. We're looking after at the moment, and, and he's just on milk for now. It's all right. The Corinthians were told, you're not ready for solids yet, only milk. Hebrews 5 verse 11 says, we have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness, but solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. It's time to grow up. We can't stay on milk forever. We need to get some solid food. But do we, do we want that? Do we try to understand? Or do we just want the pastor to spoon feed us every week? And we don't, we don't spend much time wrestling with what he's preached on. We don't spend much time reading the Bible and actually wrestling and praying it through. We're, we're not diligent. We're just happy getting fed the milk by someone else. <laughs> Maybe we need to grow up a bit. We need to grow in our faith a bit. It's possible. But we gotta, we got to want it. We've got to have that desire in our hearts. Let's think about... Peter the fisherman again for a minute. Acts 4, 13 says this about him. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. They literally saw these men who were so bold, had so much courage, impressive, and then they were like, they're quite thick. They haven't been to uni or anything. They're quite dull. But wow, they must have been with Jesus. They must have spent a lot of time with Jesus. Is that what people think about us? Forget your IQ. It doesn't matter how many degrees you've got. If you've got degrees, fantastic. But are we put into use what we know about Jesus? Are we constantly reading the Bible and we're challenging ourselves with that? What what is this teaching me about Jesus? How can I grow and be more like him from from what I know about him in this passage and what I know about myself and my own sin? We're kind of at that time of year now where your New Year's resolutions are already under threat. We're into March. So maybe you, you started a Bible reading plan, you know, these kind of read the Bible in a year type things. So you're two, just over two months in. How's it going? Have you abandoned it altogether already? Or are you sticking with it? It takes about 60 hours on average to read the Bible. Just, just once. 60 hours. So you think to yourself, well, how many hours do I spend preparing for exams or, or something at work, a, a course I'm on at work? How many hours do I spend doing that? 20 hours a week, maybe, would you say? Is that fair, 20 hours a week? Revising? Your dad's like, no. Should be. <laughs> All right, if you're sporty, if you're a health-conscious person here, how many hours a day or a week do you spend going for a run, going for a walk, going to the gym, playing whatever sports you play? For me, many years ago, it was probably five, six hours a day. So 40-plus hours a week. Maybe for some of you, it's just an hour a day. Keep you healthy, keep you fit. If you're a gamer, how many hours do you spend gaming? The average across the world is an hour a day, but serious gamers would spend more like eight hours a day, or night, usually. Eight hours, 56 hours a week. 
They could almost read the Bible every week if they spent that time reading the Bible instead of gaming. They might not have as much knowledge of Call of Duty or FIFA or any of those games, but they'd know a lot about Jesus. If we spent 15 hours a, re- a week reading our Bibles, we'd read it every month. If we just spent an hour a day reading it, we'd read it six times in a year. Half an hour a day, we'd read it three times a year. 20 minutes a day, twice. 10 minutes a day is all it takes to read the Bible once a year. 10 minutes. Me personally, this might not work for everyone, I don't have reading plans to read it so many times a year. I I, I do it on time. So I try to protect at least an hour a day sometimes two if I can, for prayer and reading only. And sometimes that's 90% prayer and and 10% reading, and sometimes it's the other way around. But it's about time with Jesus for me. Time reading his word, time praying, spending time with Jesus. I don't know how many times I'll, I'll read the Bible this year, but what I do know is the more time I spend with him, the more it benefits my soul. Because I need it. I don't know about you, but I need it. Because my memory is not great. So I can only hold on to so much information at one given time. So I need to keep reading this book to keep it fresh in my mind. Because if you've been a Christian for longer than five minutes, you'll know that everyone's trying to get a piece of your mind. And we can only hold on to so much in our lives. And so we can only take so much in. We can only hold on to so many things And so there's some things that you might need to let go to create space for what we need. So it's like um, us blokes when we go into a supermarket. We've got a little co-op just down from us in in Hereford. uh, And Carla might text me on my way back from the chapel and say, oh, could you just pick up some some bread or some bread and milk usually? And I'll go in. And that's my goal is just to get bread and milk. And we don't use baskets because baskets are not for men. We carry things. But as I'm going around and we might see something, crisps are on offer. Oh, yeah, I need a bag of crisps. So we grab some crisps, maybe some pasta. I noticed there wasn't much pasta in, so we got like, before we know it, we're we're like 15 seconds in. We've got our bread and milk, but we've also got like a two kilogram bag of pasta on the side of our head. We've got some crisps on our shoulder. We've got stuff around our pockets. And we're holding up. But then at the very end, we realize, actually, I haven't got the bread. I put that down to get hold of something else. And I need the bread. So for me to get what I need, otherwise Carla's not going to be happy when I get home, I need to let something else go because I can only hold on to so much. That's a bit like us. We can only hold on to so much. We can only take so much in. And so there's stuff we need to let go of. Stuff we just need to, to get rid of. And maybe your desire in your heart is you, you really do want to read your Bible more. You, you want to pray more. You want to grow. You really do want to grow. But you're beating yourself up because it's not happening very quickly. It seems to be taking a long time. Well, how does it work with babies and milk? Imagine the first day that you had a baby in your home and you you gave them their milk that day and you you put them down to bed in in their cot and then you woke up the following morning and there was a 30-year-old bloke in the cot. It'd be pretty scary, wouldn't it? How'd that happen? That was a growth spurt. And we do have growth spurts as Christians. We do have that spiritual growth where where things seem to fast track and happen really quickly and then other times it seems to really slow down. But usually God's way is that it's gradual. Gradual. But there's progress. We're going in the right direction. And we just keep on with that desire to grow. But here's the problem. The enemy does not want you to grow. The devil does not want you to read your Bible. And if you are going to read it, he wants it just to to puff you up and fill you full of pride. So you just go around telling everyone what they should do and how great you are and how rubbish they are. He doesn't want you to grow in grace and knowledge. 1 Timothy ends like this. Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. 
turn away from the godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed, and in so doing have departed from the faith. Grace be with you all. One Christian writer says this, readers are charged to use their knowledge to be effectively on guard since they are now aware of the tactics of the false teachers who are introducing destructive heresies and stories they've just made up, who will be blaspheming in matters they do not understand, who will be mouthing empty, boastful words and who will distort the scriptures. These are the warnings found in 2 Peter. Sometimes as Christians, we can be so uh, focused on loving people and showing grace and affection and patience that we can be gullible and we can get swept away by what people say. If you've been to a church in this area and they don't hold the Bible up as the, as the main focus point to guide us because they be, say they don't believe that it's the word of us. There are some good bits in it, but I'm not sure about that bit. And, you know, we don't have to believe everything. Run from that place. Take your Bible and run away. This is the authority that we have. This is what tells us what God thinks, what God knows, what God reveals. If you want to hear from heaven, maybe like me, you don't hear audible voices telling you what to do. You you have things that he places on your heart and things that he, he puts in your mind that you can't stop thinking about. But really, the primary way that God speaks to you is through his word. That's his, his way, his main way. One of the verses that really scares me in the Bible when I think about being discerning and not being naive is uh, Galatians 2.13 because there's this guy in the Bible called Barnabas and he's he's awesome, he's an amazing guy, really godly guy. But Galatians 2.13 frightens me because it says, even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Even the great Barnabas got swept away by a false teaching or a hypocrite. Somebody who was quite impressive but they were not godly. Not godly at all. Bad company corrupts good character. We need to be thinking about who we're spending time with. If you do want to grow, if you genuinely want to grow in grace and grow in knowledge and glorify Jesus, who are you spending your time with? Because it's harder to grow when you're surrounded by weeds stunting your growth. Much, much harder. Okay, just to finish. Do you know Jesus as prophet, as the one who's speaking words of life into your life, heavenly words. Do you know him as priest interceding for you? Do you know him as king ruling and reigning every single area of your life? Are you obsessed with Jesus? Do you think about him a lot? Because if you do, then you'll you'll let go of pride and self-righteousness and all that stuff. And you'll look to him for everything because you know and you trust that he's got everything I need. So if I am going to grow, then I need him. And then when he gives me what I need, I praise him. I give all the glory to him because I know that wasn't me. It was him. It was all him. And so if you do grow in grace and you grow in knowledge, you will naturally glorify Jesus. So be pleased to know our last point is very, very brief. (laughs) Because it will just happen. You don't have to think about it. It just happens. Because you're growing and you're giving him the glory. 2 Timothy 4.18, The Lord, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Revelation 1. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. We we grow and we glorify. So Peter closes his second letter how he began it. 2 Peter 1 verse 2. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. We're going to stand and sing our closing hymn together now and acknowledge just how great God is.
how great thou art. Let's stand together. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that your word is infallible, inerrant, completely and utterly trustworthy. And Lord, we thank you for the faithful servants in this place who read it and study it and pray upon it and wrestle with it so that they can grow in their knowledge, grow in their relationship with you. Father, we pray you would pour out your grace upon us all. We need help from heaven if we're going to grow, if we're going to change, 
if we're going to praise you and glorify you the way that you deserve that. And so we give you all the glory and all the praise this day and acknowledge that you are God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we are weak and feeble and sinful. And yet because of you, we are a royal priesthood. Lord, we praise you for who you are and who you have created us to be. And I pray, Lord, if there's someone who doesn't yet know you, please, would you humble them and save their soul. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.